it's still kind of chilly out there. Temperatures staying in the high Treasuries 40s. rose early Tomorrow's Good morning, everyone. My name is Evie Martin. I'm the lead pastor here at Platwoods Church. It's good to be gathered in this room together with you all, and also a special welcome to those of you joining us online today. Last fall, I added a new rhythm to my life. Needing to be more active and take better care of my physical health, I started taking Pure Bar classes. I've shared about this before with you all, mostly because it is agony and I need a safe space to complain. So you are that safe space. But in February, I hit a milestone. I made it to 50 classes. It, thank you. <laughs> it was a big deal. They took my picture, it went on Instagram, I got a free pair of socks, I uh, was feeling pretty proud of myself. I accomplished something. But in the grand scheme of things, at 50 classes, I have only just begun. I know this because I remarked to my friend who recently got her 500th class picture taken. So it, it gets easier from here now, right? And she said, oh sister, you've got the hang of it now, sure, but this never gets easy. Practice never makes perfect. But it will strengthen my core so I have fewer back problems. It will build muscle so I don't lose bone density. It will improve balance and strength so I can pick up and hug my almost nine-year-old just a little bit longer. In practice, we learn what to do and how to do it, but it will never be easy. If it ever became easy, it would cease to change us. These weeks leading up to Easter have been centered on the importance of spiritual practice in our lives, the patterns and the habits we take on to strengthen our spiritual core. There's not an end goal in mind, but the practicing itself is what changes us, what centers us, what increases our balance over time as the world comes at us demanding we conform. Last week, we talked about going into airplane mode with the inward practices, things like meditation and prayer and study and fasting. We turn off distractions from the world around to visit our own hearts and minds and create space for Jesus to dwell with us there. The work we do in our interior lives is hard because no one can do it but us. But these inward practices are where our personal change begins. Today, we'll move to Bluetooth mode. We'll be exploring what we call outward practices, which bring us into connection with others around us. And like last week, there are, there are many practices that we can adopt in this way. But in this series specifically, we're using the work of Richard Foster a book called Celebration of Discipline as a Guide. So pulling from his work, today we'll look at the practices of simplicity, solitude, and service. We call these outward practices because they're visible from the outside, but also because they take us outside of ourselves. But I don't want to be misleading. Even the outward practices have to originate from deep within if we practice, for example, simplicity because of external motivations, then simplicity itself becomes the goal and we fixate on the practice itself and not what's happening within. If we practice service, for example, from a place of exterior influence, we end up serving for our own sake, not for the true benefit of others. These practices may look good from the outside, but be completely empty on the inside. It makes me think of a recent experience I had in Scottsdale, Arizona. 
A couple of weeks ago, I was there with some clergy colleagues, and we were leaving the hotel to go to dinner in Old Town. Uber sent us an autonomous vehicle. It was a Jaguar I-Pace SUV. It pulled up like a normal car. It looked mostly like a normal car. It drove like a normal car, except there was no driver. Just an empty seat and a steering wheel that turns on its own. It did all the things it was supposed to do, but there was nothing on the inside. Except for us, of course, the passengers, we just sat basically stone still, <laughs> whispering the whole 12-minute ride, terrified that something would go horribly wrong. Obviously, it didn't, but still. All that to say, if, if our focus is on the outer appearance of our practices, we may look fine, but be left empty on the inside, wondering if everything is going wrong. Even our outward practices are driven from within. Do you all remember the old shaker hymn, "'Tis the gift to be simple, tis the gift to be free." "'Tis the gift to come down where we ought to be." You can sing it with me. "'And when we find ourselves in the place just right, "'twill be in the valley of love and delight.'" You know it, you know it. The Shakers teach us in one line of a song what the practice of simplicity does to us. It makes us free. Every single one of us knows this. When our lives, our spaces, our schedules are cluttered, full, overstocked, we feel trapped, shackled. We even call our lives rat races. <laughs> and by rats, we mean captive creatures striving to get out of a structure specifically designed to confine them. <laughs> Complicated, consumeristic lives do not make us free. Simplicity is Freedom. You might remember a few weeks ago, Pastor Matt taught that these spiritual practices are not meant as more things that we have to do which exhaust and bore and bind us. Their purpose is ultimately joy. When we are getting simplicity right, the song says, we'll find ourselves in the valley of love and delight. Our lives will simply be more joyful. Because we are so deeply enmeshed in modern culture and not living outside of it with an outside perspective, it can be hard for us to reflect upon it critically. But Foster, in his book, points out that modern culture is sick. He calls it psychotic, even. We crave things we neither need nor enjoy. Collectively, we do not have a divine center, so we feel insecure. And what do we do to create that sense of security? We attach ourselves to things, to stuff, to acquisition and accumulation. We buy things we do not want to impress people we do not like. Society is sick. And conformity to a sick society is to be sick ourselves. This sickness is far from joyful. It is far from free. Simplicity, then, is a practice that can heal us and make us more whole. It's also a practice that is not ambiguous. It's not something we have to build a theological case for. It is crystal clear in the life and teaching of Jesus himself. There are many things in the Bible that are ambiguous and require us to do careful interpretive work. Jesus' economic principles are not one of those things. We just did a series in February about money and generosity and the biblical principles that guide us in relation to our stuff, so I won't dwell here long. But the bottom line of Jesus' extensive teaching about money and stuff is less is more. It's right there, somewhere in Matthew. I think he says it that way. I'm kidding. He doesn't say it that way, but that's the sum, summative statement there. The less stuff we have, the fewer idols compete for our loyalty. The less stuff we have, the more freedom we have to respond to God and to others. The less stuff we have, the more content we can be in all circumstances. 
The practice of simplicity is is not to say that we renounce possessions entirely and live with nothing. I'm not telling you to wear a burlap sack and come live at the church. (laughs) That's what we would call aestheticism. Simplicity, by contrast, puts our possessions in proper perspectives. Foster says it this way, simplicity knows contentment in both abasement and abounding. It is the only thing that sufficiently reorients our lives so that possessions can be genuinely enjoyed without destroying us. So what has to happen within us to begin this practice of simplicity? We need a new focal point. If simplicity itself becomes our focal point, then the means become the end and we run ourselves ragged, always worrying, are we being simple enough? Do we have too many things? Do we not have the right things? Instead, Jesus tells us clearly that the focal point is the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be yours as well. That is actually in Matthew chapter six. First, is the key word here. What is simple is that we set our sights first on the kingdom of God and the righteousness, another way to think about righteousness is right relationships that it leads us to. And then everything else falls in line behind that. This is the inward place where this practice has to begin by setting our focal point as the seeking of God's kingdom. The outer actions then are born from this seeking and those outer actions can take a lot of different forms, but there are, here are some principles that might help guide us as we get started, just to give you a framework. First of all, buy things for their usefulness, not for their status. This is a litmus test for everything from cars to phones to clothes to groceries. This is covered in, I think, like first grade curriculum, right, teachers? Identifying the difference between need and want somewhere, yeah. Second, reject the things that are producing an addiction in you. And I'm not speaking strictly of substance addiction here, although that's included. But there are plenty of other addictions too. Food, sweets, shopping, screens, push back against their pull on you. Three, develop a habit of giving things away. Get rid of it. If you don't have it, it can't control you. Refuse to be manipulated Don't let advertisers and marketers and tech moguls tell you what you need. They have no idea. Don't give them that power. And five, enjoy things without owning them. The myth of ownership makes us feel like we have to have some semblance of control. Resist that lie. There are so many things in life that can be fully enjoyed without being possessed. Just a few guidelines as we get started. Simplicity, as we learn to practice it in our lives, will make us free. The second outward practice that I'll lift up today is solitude. Solitude may not sound very outward at first. What does being alone have to do with how we interact with the people in the world around us? The answer is everything. I have two kids. One has lived in his own world and on his own time since he entered the world seven days late. He has always been content to self-entertain. As a baby, he would wake up and just happily hold court in his crib with all his stuffies and the art on the wall until a grown-up came in and found him ready for the day. Later, he would play for hours on his own with a set of connects or paper and crayons. The other child, to this day, and he is almost nine, refuses to go upstairs to get his socks by himself unless there is another human being in his line of sight. (laughs) Solitude will be a struggle for this one. But solitude and being alone are not exactly the same. Solitude is more a state of mind. Because when we practice it, the deep truth we encounter is, of course, that we are never alone. The muscles that we develop by practicing solitude are not to make us better at being by ourselves. They actually strengthen and change the way we are with others. 
We see this clearly in the way that Jesus models solitude for us. He regularly seeks out solitary times and places, but when he does, it's always right after or right before he is spending significant time with other people. He is in solitude in the wilderness right before his ministry begins. Right before he chooses his 12 disciples, he spends the night in the desert hills. After the feeding of the 5,000, he goes to the hills by himself. He heals the leper, and then he withdraws alone. The last night before he goes to the cross, he seeks solitude in the Garden of Gethsemane. Sometimes we look at Jesus' pattern and say, oh, he must have been an introvert. He needed his alone time to recharge I wonder if what we are to learn from his pattern is less about personality and more about practice. Was Jesus' solitude less about regaining balance in his emotional energy and more about gaining clarity and distilling wisdom about those he would encounter? Certainly there is rest inherent in solitude, but it seems he went there for more than that. In solitude, he repeatedly regained his center in God's purpose for his life and his love for other people. Not to practice solitude and silence is selfish and self-absorbed. That might sound counterintuitive. But we think too highly of ourselves when we believe that our action and our speech and our busyness is the best solution to any problem. Our fear tells us that we can fill every void and solve every problem with our speech, our words. Silence and solitude teach us that we cannot. They force us to listen rather than to speak, reshaping our disposition then toward other people and toward the hurt of the world. To take a step into this practice of solitude, we might begin with little solitudes. Find those snatches of time that are scattered throughout your day that is typically lost to you. What moments already exist that you can reclaim and not forfeit to the chatter of television or the internet? Maybe it's your first moments after waking, the commute to work, a moment of silence before each meal. Can we train ourselves to create little solitudes, even in the midst of a big crowd or a busy day? Another step might be to create a quiet place. It's your quiet place. It doesn't have to be a whole room, although it could be. Maybe it's just one chair. Set it apart. Make it known to all in the house that this is a quiet place for whoever needs it whenever they need it. Maybe it's a tree at a park. Maybe it's a bench outside your office. Can you claim a quiet place and begin to visit it by yourself? Maybe your time there even increases as you continue to practice. And can you take a step of silence? of resisting the urge to speak in response to everything. Some of you are already better at this than others. Can you become aware of moments when your speech isn't necessary, but rather your silence is more appropriate? Can you find ways to communicate care and compassion for others that does not require words? What might it feel like to develop this muscle of compassion that is born out of our solitude? The practice of solitude turns us toward others with compassion and with sensitivity. It heals us of our own selfishness. Finally, the last and perhaps the most obvious outward practice we'll explore today is service. Now, none of these practices are really sequential. You don't have to do one before another. But in some ways, the practices of simplicity and solitude do condition our hearts to engage in service to others. That's where they will always lead. The practice of service is captured for us in one snapshot in the Gospel of John, chapter 13. You can remember all that you need to know about it with the singular image of a towel. Jesus and his disciples were sharing the evening meal. The devil had already provoked Judas, Simon Iscariot's son, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew the Father had given everything into his hands and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the table and took off his robes, 
Picking up a linen towel, he tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a wash basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he was wearing. This is the story we'll read again in just a few short weeks at our Holy Thursday service, remembering the events of the Last Supper Jesus had with his disciples. In another version of this same story, the one in the Gospel of Luke, the disciples are arguing over who among them will be the greatest. And anytime there's a conversation about the greatest, that means there's also going to be a least. This is sort of what humans do. We sort ourselves out. Most of us know that we are not likely to be the greatest in most situations, but that's fine as long as we're not the least. We can come to terms with our place in the pecking order as long as it's not on the bottom rung of the ladder in the chicken pen. Jesus, presumably at that same meal, looks around carefully at these people to whom he is about to entrust the entirety of his ministry. Everyone's feet are still dusty and dirty from the walk to the house. They need to be washed, but there was no servant around to do the job that no one but a servant should do. So there they sit with dirty feet, arguing about who will be greatest so no one has to be least. Jesus, unquestionably the greatest among them, gets up without a word, takes a towel and then a basin with water, kneels down, placing himself lower than his students and washes every last foot in that room. I imagine the room was uncomfortably quiet for the entire time that it took him to wash 24, however many feet there were. It's hard to come up with something meaningful to say when your mouth is full of humble pie. In these moments, however long it took, Jesus didn't just reverse the pecking order for life in his kingdom. He completely abolished it. There was no longer first and last or least and greatest. There weren't people who should serve and people who should be served. Followers of Jesus were to pick up a towel and wash whoever's feet were dirty. It is so important that this be our model for the practice of service because we Christians, well-meaning as we are, can be quick to pick and choose and justify who and when and how we want to serve. Service is seen as virtuous. It's looked upon with admiration and respect. It can make us feel really good about ourselves when all the conditions are just right. Service, when we're not careful, can be very self-righteous. And then we have gone horribly wrong. Service that's really about ourselves seeks praise and acknowledgement. Modest, of course, but recognition does matter. True service is content with its hiddenness. It doesn't matter if no one knows what we did. Service that is for ourselves is highly concerned with results. We want to know that our action made an impact, that a life was changed, that the person we served was grateful. True service needs no results. The delight is only in the service. Self-righteous service is disruptive and insensitive. It determines what the need is without listening or paying attention. It often does more harm than good. Churches have been doing this kind of service in countries all over the world for generations. Fixing problems that no one asked them to fix. True service is born out of discernment and humility in listening to those we think of as least. Self-righteous service is temporary. We do it when we feel like it, when it's convenient, when we feel like someone deserves it. 
True service is a lifestyle. It is a posture. It's open eyes and ears to whomever may be in need around us. True service comes when we stop trying to determine who and where and how we are going to serve and simply show up to every day of our lives with a towel in hand. Willing to be confronted with the service that people actually need. People we might not expect in ways we couldn't imagine. Jesus practiced service not with just a particular group of people, but with his disciples, with a wealthy Roman centurion, with women, with a leper, with the poor, the blind. There was no single archetype. He healed, he washed feet, he listened, he spoke words of life as service. When the last foot was washed and none of the disciples could look one another in the eye, I imagine Jesus wrung out the now sopping, wet, dirty towel into the bowl. Maybe he walked over to the window to dump the water to the ground below and then poured some fresh water over his hands and straightened out his robe, disheveled from all the kneeling and moving around on the floor. He sat back down at his place at the table. And I can't help but wonder, as he looked lovingly at each of his followers, beckoning them to meet his eyes. If he handed the wrung out towel to Peter, or maybe John, or maybe even Mary Magdalene, and said, just as I have done, you must also do. The practice of service isn't optional. This was his new commandment to those at that table to us. As these practices of simplicity, solitude, and service build our spiritual muscles to turn outward toward others with wisdom and discernment, with humility and compassion, maybe we can simply end this moment and then begin each day by praying. Will you join with me? Lord Jesus, as it would please you, bring me someone today whom I can serve. Amen.